Welcome back. You're watching Australian Agenda. Well, during the week there has been a high-profile campaign by the Australian Indigenous Education Foundation and their CEO, Andrew Penfold, about the issue of the first Indigenous Prime Minister and whether it will happen or how quickly it may happen. And to discuss that as well as his organisation more generally, as well as Indigenous Matters more generally, we're joined by Andrew Penfold. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Peter. Great to be here. Can I just start, I guess, for our viewers by asking you to give us a bit of a snapshot of, of what it is you do. You have this organisation. It's about providing Indigenous Australians with educational opportunities. Uh, Peter Garrett has just given uh, a little bit more money to it. It's regarded as a successful scheme. You heard Joe Hockey say the same thing just a moment ago before the break. W what's the structure of what you do for Indigenous kids? So essentially we have raised uh, quite a significant amount of money in partnership with the government and the private sector to create a long-term fund to provide scholarships for Aboriginal kids to go to some of the best schools in the country. So uh, we provide scholarships for them to access these great schools and then we support those kids into their careers after they leave school. And over the last few years we've been doing this, we've achieved a really great success rate where over 90% of the kids who are coming into these schools are staying at school and moving through to complete Year 12. And of course Year 12 completion is one of the really key aspects of the Closing the Gap agenda. So how did this start? Uh, well, I um, uh, spent my career really as a, as a lawyer and a banker and about 10 years ago I walked away from that and started raising money for one program in a school in Sydney that had started enrolling Aboriginal kids in the school and I just thought it really is a no-brainer that, you know, if we're talking about this great national challenge of Indigenous inequality and we know that education really is the key to reversing that and breaking that cycle, why is it that we don't have opportunities for our most marginalised kids to go to the best schools. So I spent five years doing that on a pro bono basis and uh, achieved really good results and I saw the evidence coming out of that every day. And so about five years ago we then took that proposal to the government to say this is proven, this is working, we can see the results and we can see the kids coming through school going on to great careers. Let's work together to see if we can increase the numbers to do that. Because it's, it's an interesting one, because I think as successful as I know your scheme is, I've read up on it, uh, it's one of those ones where uh, I think a lot of people watching money go into uh, trying to help Indigenous communities to lift themselves out of poverty and to help individuals as well, wonder about whether the money going in is being matched by outcomes on the other side. Uh, it sounds like your scheme does that. What, what are the sort of factors, I guess, uh, that, that, that make it that successful? I, I mean, I just I think you touch on something there, which is the whole sort of backdrop, I guess, of this um, Indigenous Prime Minister campaign we've been running this week, and that is that, um, you know, there is this perception out there, two-thirds of Australians think we'll never see an Aboriginal Prime Minister, and that's not based on prejudice. It's actually based on the fact that people have seen so much money being spent in Indigenous affairs over decades from all governments of all persuasions, and yet there's really little improvement in the lives of the people that those programs have been targeting. So what we're trying to do is to say that actually if you invest in proven evidence-based outcome policy, that you can actually achieve results and you can actually get good outcomes coming from education if kids are given the opportunity to go to good schools. How many Indigenous kids are in the program at the moment? I think you intend to expand it. What sort of numbers are we looking at there? So we started with a fund to raise $40 million and the target of that was to educate 2,000 kids over the next 20 years. Already we've had 415, 416 students go through the program with that 90% success rate. But that initial $40 million fund is there to provide long-term, sustainable, reliable funding so that we can really invest in generational change over that 20-year period. Um, unfortunately, um, the biggest disappointment in our work is that we're unable to keep up with demand. So we're getting contacted by mothers and grandmothers and families and fathers and community people, representatives all around the country and schools saying how can we be part of this and how can we get involved. So having raised that initial $40 million in joint venture with the government and the private sector, we're now saying um, we can't keep up with demand, we'd like to expand that and so we're now seeking to raise another $100 million so that we can lift our target from 2,000 kids to 7,000 kids at the best schools in the country. Well, you've made the point about strong demand, so on what basis do you select Indigenous kids for the program? It's uh, very much around the enthusiasm of the student and the parental support. So kids with any level of academic ability can succeed if they've got enthusiasm, aspiration, they've, they're keen to seize the opportunity, make the most of that opportunity they've been provided with, and they've got strong backing at home from family or carers or grandparents or their community more broadly. So we're really looking at how keen are the kids and how, how strong is the support from home. Presumably that, the, the reason that that strong backing is so important is, is I'm wondering, is it... Is it 
Is there controversy in, in the Indigenous community more broadly about this? Because obviously you're taking kids out of their communities and putting them into, into boarding schools, private schools. Is that controversial or is that just seen as giving them the best education and then they go back to their communities? Well, we, you know, we'd love to see the day where kids don't need to go away to school to get a good quality education. And unfortunately at the moment there are schools which are not delivering those outcomes for kids in those communities. I think the important thing is though we're not... Do people accept that though? Is that, is, or is that something that is... Controversial. Oh, no, I think there's a lot of move towards improving school and education outcomes right across the country. The important thing here is that we're not actually advocating that Indigenous kids should go to boarding school or should go away from home to go to boarding school. We're simply saying they deserve the opportunity to get good quality education. And if we've got mothers and grandmothers and parents around the country who desperately want their kids to get a great education now, not in a year or five years or ten years or twenty years when other education opportunities are improved, they want this opportunity for their kids now, we want to open the doors for them. Well, if you're looking at an expansion to about 7,000, that is a pretty significant expansion. So uh, you're looking to uh, widen the net of schools involved. How would you approach this overall? So that's exactly what we do. We have expanded from you know one school in 2008 when we first started this to 34 schools across the country now. We really look for schools that have got skin in the game and an existing track record of having established a really meaningful program themselves with a culturally inclusive environment and high quality partners pastoral care and so on. And so what we're looking for is, and we're inundated again with schools all around the country who are saying, we'd really like to have more Indigenous children into our school if they, are, if they want to come here. These schools are getting inundated with applications, demand that they can't keep up with. So we're saying, if you have invested your own resources, built your own program, we'd like to help you grow that program and sustain it for the long period so that schools and teachers can actually spend their time you know, educating kids in classrooms and pastoral care and so on, not worrying about where the money's going to come from and how they, what forms they've got to fill out in the process. What do these Indigenous students do once they graduate? I mean, what's your evidence show you about those that have gone through the program and, and moved on with the rest of their lives? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we've had 90% of kids who have actually stayed at school and moved through to Year 12 completion, and then about 92% of those kids have gone on to university, jobs, employment, traineeships and so on. And importantly, you know, a, a kid who comes through school completes Year 12 does an apprenticeship as a plumber or, or, a, or a builder is the same outcome for us as one who goes and does engineering or law or medicine at university. So it's all about making sure kids have a successful transition to their career. So we know that of all the kids who come through the school, the, the school and the, on their scholarships, the, the year 12 completion rate is actually the highest year 12 completion rate of any program in the country. And then of those kids, 92% of them are transitioning through to successful careers and university. And they're studying everything and a very broad range of careers as you'd expect from any cohort. Of and we mentioned that uh, the government have given you an extra 10 million, you wanted 100 million, presumably uh, that will allow you to do roughly one tenth of what you'd hoped, um, but you'll just keep campaigning for more money. Well, exactly. You know, $10 million is a lot of money, but uh, against the backdrop of our target to raise another $100 million, we've got a long way to go. So, uh, you know, we've got 10, we need another 40. Our model's always been about working with the private sector, and Joe mentioned that earlier. Um, it's about how do you engage the private sector, because it's not just the money that comes from the private sector, it's also their skills and capabilities. Uh, it's Commonwealth Bank, we've got over 100 staff members mentoring kids one-on-one, -on -one and, you know, and all sorts of other programs we do with that with the big companies. So it's about how how do we leverage their investment, but also how do we leverage their skills and expertise and so on to help create better outcomes and shared value across all of the, all of the stakeholders? Andrew Penfold, we appreciate you joining us on Australian Agenda. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Peter. Paul Kelly, as always, thanks for joining me on the program. And thank you for your company as well. We've got the budget, of course, on Tuesday. Wayne Swan will be delivering that. Next Sunday, we'll be speaking for a state perspective to New South Wales Premier Barry O'Farrell. He'll be here with us live in the studio. Plus, our panel will dissect what the budget means for you. See you then.